Today we are going to look at a number of topics um, closely related to cell biology. The first topic we are going to look at is intercellular communications or basically what we call cell-to-cell -cell signaling. In this topic, we are going to address the following things. We are going to state how cells communicate with each other. We are also going to see the difference between direct and indirect types of intercellular communications. We are going to define some two terms here, one being what we call secretory cell and the other one being what we call target cell. We are going to describe the mechanisms of signaling that occur at the target cell. We are also going to outline the classification of chemical messengers. And lastly, I'll give you examples of common chemical messengers or what we call ligands. It's a short lecture though, in as much as uh, the objectives appear a lot. So first, we need to understand that cells can communicate with each other. And that is what we call intercellular communication. Communication between one cell and another within the body is what we call intercellular communication. There are two types of intercellular communication. There is what we call direct type of intercellular communication. There's also what we call the indirect type of intercellular communication. So to begin with, when we talk of direct type of communication, this is how we call it when the two cells are physically in contact. So direct communications occur where the two cells are in physical contact. That therefore means that in the indirect type of communication, the two cells are not in contact. So when we talk about direct communication where the two cells are in contact, there are two possibilities that we can talk about. When the two cells are in contact, you want to know what is actually linking the two cells. So there's a scenario where the two cells could be linked by gap junctions, like what we see here. The two, cell, the two cells are linked by gap junctions. Gap junctions enable the cytoplasm of this cell and the cytoplasm of the other cell to be in continuous. That means therefore that if there is any ion here, like this molecule here, it can easily diffuse to the other one. You remember we talked about types of transport of small molecules. Those small molecules can easily go through the gap junctions to the other cell and vice versa. If there is something that is high concentration on this side, it can easily move to the other side. So cells do communicate via gap junctions. Communication through gap junctions is an example of direct intercellular communication. Examples of cells that communicate through gap junctions include smooth muscle cells and cardiac muscle cells. Adjacent cells will move or rather will communicate through such junctions. And communication through gap junctions is usually very fast. The second type of direct intercellular communication is where the two cells 
are communicating via some surface molecules. For example, in this image, there are some surface molecules, which means that those molecules are on the cell membrane. The surface molecule of this cell and surface molecule of the other cell. And kind of this other surface molecule is a receptor for this one. So the two cells can communicate with each other via surface molecules. The best example of cells that do communicate through surface molecules would be some white blood cells, or generally, let's say, cells of the immune system. They tend to use surface molecules for communication, cells of the immune system. So that is direct communication. Okay, so people are saying they're not hearing me. Are the others hearing me? Yes. Yes. Oh. Yes. So it's their network. Okay, let me just write that. All right, so we've talked about direct type of communications. Now let's talk about the indirect type of communications. So as I mentioned earlier, for direct communication, the cells are in physical contact. That means that for indirect communication, the cells are not in physical contact contact. The two cells are not physically linked. There is some distance between them. If there is some distance between the two cells, then you ask yourself, how will these two cells then communicate? Now, first of all, we need to understand that for two cells to communicate, one cell must initiate that communication and the other cell must respond to that communication for us to say that communication has occurred. For one cell to, for these two cells to communicate yet there is physical distance between them, it means that the cell that initiates the communication will communicate using chemical messengers. And that's the whole point about indirect communication. For indirect communications, communication is made possible by release of chemical messengers. The cell that initiates communication releases chemical messengers. Those are the messengers, those are the chemicals that will move to the cell that responds to that communication. Now, the term given for chemical messengers is ligand. So a ligand is a chemical messenger. Now, let's define some terms therefore. The cell that initiates communication is the one we call the secretory cell because it is the one that releases the chemical messenger. On the other hand, the cell that responds to the communication, which means it's responding to the chemical messengers which have been released, that particular cell is what we call the target cell. It is important, therefore, to note that the secretory cell 
is the one that synthesizes and releases the ligand. I gave you that assignment of protein synthesis. I hope you're done by now. So the secretory cell will synthesize that ligand. It could be a protein. Then releases that ligand out of the cell. Of course, usually through exocytosis. Then that chemical will travel through different mechanisms that we'll talk about later, maybe not today. Okay, partially today. Those chemical messengers travel through different mechanisms until they reach the target cell. Now, what is unique about the target cell is that the target cell contain receptors. Those receptors could be on the cell membrane or could be within the cell itself, inside. Either way, the target cell contain receptors for that particular ligand. So the ligand could be a hormone, for example. It means that the secretory cell will release the hormone. So take, take, for example, your pituitary gland producing, let's say, growth hormone. You want this growth hormone to stimulate some cells in your bone let's say it's in the femur. So the cells of your femur will then contain receptors for growth hormone. And so that growth hormone will actually target the bone cells. In this case, maybe then the femur. And then <clears throat> the target cell is the one that will then respond to that communication by initiating particular cellular responses. In this case, now you need cell division, and that's what will happen. So anyway, the point here is that the target cell contains receptors for the ligand. If a cell does not have a receptor, then it is not a target cell. Target cells are defined by the presence of receptors. If you remember, we talked about cell membrane proteins, and we say that one of the classes of cell membrane proteins are receptors. Now let's see what happens at the target cell. Once the chemical has reached the target cell, so what happens? Once the chemical reaches the target cell, <clears throat> the chemical will bind to its receptor, as I've just told you. The binding of the ligand to its receptor activates an intracellular molecular cascade. Now I want to just leave it at that because there's a lot of intracellular molecular cascade that happen which is beyond the scope of these lectures. You will mention some of them in your pharmacology You'll mention some of them in your physio in your immunology. But for now, let me just say that there are a lot of intracellular molecular cascade that are activated when the ligand binds to its receptor. Eventually, that molecular cascade will activate things within the cell. Now, what kind of things will be activated within the cell? There are some target factors within the cell that will be activated by this molecular cascade, and it depends on the type of communication that was there. So it could be that an enzyme is activated within the cell. It could be genes are activated within the cell. It could be the cytoskeleton is what is activated. You remember microtubules, microfilaments, intermediate filaments. These are the ones which are activated. Or it could be ion channels are the ones which are activated by this intercellular cascade. Now, depending on whatever is activated, <clears throat> 
then you can eventually have final cellular responses. For example, if you activate an enzyme, then you will expect to have alteration in metabolism. Either there is increased metabolism or you actually inhibit metabolism depending on what type of enzyme you've activated. If it's gene that is activated, then it means that you'll have altered gene expression in terms of protein synthesis. If it is cytoskeleton that is activated, then it means you may have, let's say, movement of the cell because cytoskeleton is responsible for movement, motility in the cell. One of their functions is movement. It could be cell division because microtubules are important in cell division. If it is ion channels which are activated, then you may have transport of some molecules either into or out of the cell because it means you open ion channels. And so it means that some small molecules can either enter or leave the cell. So this is what happens at the target cell. The ligand will bind to the receptor, activate intercellular molecular cascade, very extensive cascade, I don't want to go into it, but eventually you activate some targets within the cell, could be enzymes, could be genes, could be cytoskeleton, could be ion channels. So depending on what has been activated, then you'll have final cellular responses. The cell will respond in a particular way. Right, having said that, let me now give you classification of ligands. We have said that ligands are chemical messengers. Now we classify ligands in different categories. We can have what you call autocrine ligands, paracrine ligands, neurotransmitters, hormones, and neurohormones. These are four classes, sorry, five classes of ligands. And I want us to talk about each of them. So let me just move to the next slide because the names are going to appear again. Let's begin with paracrine ligands or paracrine chemicals. What are we calling paracrine ligands? Now, you call that chemical paracrine chemical if the secretory cell and the target cell are nearby each other. They are not necessarily in contact because remember, this is a form of indirect communication. But the secretory cell and the target cell are within one neighborhood. Therefore, the chemicals which are being released by the secretory cell travel via the extracellular fluid to the target cell. It's just through simple diffusion from the secretory cell, the chemical will just diffuse in the interstitial fluid to reach the target cell. If that happens, then we call that paracrine signaling or that chemical will therefore be classified as a paracrine ligand. It's a ligand, but it's paracrine because being released by a cell within the neighborhood. You can also have what we call neurotransmitter. So what's a neurotransmitter? You call it a neurotransmitter if that chemical is being released by a neuron and it's going to another neuron. If the chemical being released is being released by a neuron, which means that the secretory cell is a neuron. If the secretory cell is a neuron, 
and the target cell is a neuron, then you call that chemical a neurotransmitter. Like here, this is a neuron, that's another neuron, so that chemical, that ligand becomes a neurotransmitter. You can also have hormone. When do we call it hormone? A ligand is termed a hormone if that ligand is released into the bloodstream. Now, the criteria here is that the target cell is far away from the secretory cell. So the only way in which that chemical can reach the target cell is if that chemical is transported through the bloodstream. Therefore, the secretory cell must release this chemical into the bloodstream and the bloodstream will then transport that chemical from the site that has, it has been released into. That means from the secretory cell, the bloodstream must transport this chemical all the way to the target cell. We can still revisit the concept I gave you about pituitary gland releasing growth hormone which acts on some cells in the femur. There is no way growth hormone can travel all the way from the brain to your lower limb through diffusion. It will never reach. But this is made possible if that chemical is released into the bloodstream. So when chemical messengers are released into the bloodstream, we call those chemical messengers hormones. Such type of ligands are called hormones. Lastly, okay, there is another class that uh, I didn't put there, but remember I'd mentioned neurohormones. So you call it a neurohormone when it is a neuron releasing the chemical into the bloodstream. Then you call it neurohormone. If a neuron is the one releasing that chemical into the bloodstream. You call it neurohormone. And I remember there was also another one called autocrine. You call it autocrine if the cell that has released the signal, the cell that has released the chemical, is also the target cell that becomes autocrine. So don't confuse autocrine with paracrine. You call it autocrine if the secretory cell is also the target cell. So we may not want to call that indirect type of communication per se. It's a unique type of communication, but either way, it's a type of chemical signaling. Paracrine is where the target cells are within the neighborhood. Neurotransmitter is where a neuron releases a chemical, and that chemical goes to another neuron. Hormone is where a cell releases a chemical into the bloodstream to go to tag a distant target cell. Neurohormone is where a neuron releases a chemical into the bloodstream. You may have heard of pheromones. Those may not really apply in humans per se. Pheromones may not apply in humans per se, but they could apply in other animals. So let's not talk about them. Right, so the last thing I want to do is to give you examples of common chemical messengers as we finish. You can have chemical messengers which are amino acids. Usually there are four major amino acids which are used as chemical messengers in the body. And these four are examples of chemical messengers, which are basically amino acids, glutamate, aspartate, glycine, and what we call GABA. GABA stands for gamma aminobutyric acid. You can just call it GABA. 
These are amino acids, which are chemical messengers. Gamma amino butyric acid. There are some chemical messengers which are called amines. An amine is where you have two amino acids. All right. So you have histamine, serotonin, catecholamines. Catecholamines include things like adrenaline and noradrenaline. Then we have T3 and T4. These are thyroid hormones. T4 is what we call thyroxine. The name for T3 is very long. Don't care about it for now. You can just call it T3. It stands for triiodothyronine. I'm just giving you examples of chemical messengers which are amines in nature. You can also have chemical messengers, which are proteins or glycoproteins. These are the majority, actually. So pituitary hormones like growth hormone, antidiuretic hormone, prolactin, those pituitary hormones, they are proteins or glycoproteins. Also pancreatic hormones fall under this category insulin, glucagon, those are either proteins or glycoproteins. You can have steroids. Steroids have cholesterol within their backbone. So they have cholesterol within them. Examples of steroid chemicals are gonadal hormones. So gonadal hormones are hormones from the testes and ovary. That means they include things like testosterone. They include things like estrogen and progesterone. We also have corticosteroids. Corticosteroids are steroids from the adrenal cortex. Such include things like cortisol, it's a hormone. Aldosterone is a hormone. We can keep to those two for now. Lastly, we have what you call eicosanoids. Eicosanoids are chemicals which are formed from membrane lipids. The lipids in the cell membrane are the ones which form these chemicals. So examples include prostaglandins, leukotriene, and thromboxane. You'll come across these ones mainly even in immunology. They tend to be inflammatory markers, these ones. They tend to be inflammatory markers. So these are examples of common chemical messengers. The intention here is not to make you remember everything on this list. That is not the intention. The intention is to make you know that we don't just have one category of chemical messenger. There are many chemical messengers. So it doesn't really matter much if you don't remember examples of chemical messengers that I've given you here. I'll be happier if you know that chemical messengers can be many and if you remember two or three examples, that's good enough. Right. So I'm done with the first part of the lecture. There are some questions I've projected for you there. I want you to discuss them. Or rather not discuss, but just look at them. And uh, be sure that... Uh, you are able to answer them. I'm just leaving them there for a minute. Then I, I go straight ahead to the next class. I don't think you're already tired.
So I'll start the next session immediately before I give you, I'll give you a break at the end towards in the middle. We have like three sessions today, so I'm done with the first one. I'll go direct to the second one, and then I'll give you a break between the second and the third. One minute, just look at that. If you have a question, also feel free to ask. Okay, so this quiz are just for you, not, not for submission. Right, let's start the next topic. So the next topic is going to be body fluid compartments. This may not necessarily be part of cell biology, but you need to know body fluid compartments before we talk about the last lecture on cytology which is on membrane physiology largely talking about electrical activities on the cell membrane for us to understand that topic that we are going to do next you need to understand body fluid compartments so body fluid compartment may not necessarily be part of cell biology but we need to have it here before you understand the next lecture we're going to have. 